morning, everyone, and uh, I'd like you. I'd like to welcome you to uh, this morning's edition of uh, the Evident Academy, and uh, it's my pleasure to introduce you to uh, an individual who's. I mean, he falls under one of the smartest people I know. Uh, certainly, uh, you, you know, when it comes to technology and three D printing technology, they know their stuff, and I'd like to welcome. Hoob Van Esbrook of uh, Structo 3D. Good morning, Hoob. Hey, Paolo. Thank you. Thanks for uh, for inviting me, and uh, thanks for uh, for the nice welcome. Yeah, and uh, Hoob is the co-founder of uh, Structo 3D, and we met a few years ago. And and uh, over this period, we've we've actually become you know good friends, and we chat away here and there, and. Uh, exchange ideas and uh, as a result of that you know uh, we've got both a, a business relationship and a, and a bit of a personal relationship so Boob I, I think my first question is uh, probably the same thing everyone's thinking of like A you look young and B how does one go from like elementary school all the way to 3D printing? <laughs> That's uh... Uh, that's a good question. Um, well, I won't start at elementary school. Let me skip all that part. But, uh, you know, uh, well, my background, um, originally I'm Dutch. Um, I ended up uh, living in Singapore, going to school in Singapore, um, and ultimately starting the company there. Um, my background is in mechanical engineering. Um, and it was sort of at, at, at school, really, at the time in, in university around 2012, um, together with three other other uh, guys, the co-founders of the company, um, we were messing around with, with 3D printers. Well, originally 2D printers, we, we were trying to build a, a paper printer, just a document printer that doesn't use any ink. So we were trying to use lasers um, to burn black marks into paper uh, so that you could just sort of print for free. Um, realized it didn't, you know, small fires um, and realized that actually the, the, the the business model of, of paper printing was was kind of on a decline. Um, pivoted into 3D printing. I think if you were looking at 3D printing in sort of that era, 2014, um, this was when when MakerBot was sold for a, for a massive amount. When Formulas was sort of getting going, and Kickstarter was the biggest thing. Um, and so, if you were an engineering student in that period, you were either building a 3D printer or building a drone or you know one of those two things, pretty much. Um, so we were just playing around and essentially trying to build something that was cheap and accessible um, and could scale quickly. And so we, we actually bought a secondhand uh, uh, monitor computer display, um, ripped out the LCD. We bought a UV curing nail polish drying gun for $10 and started experimenting with that with some photo curing resins that we had. Um, and realized that actually this was a pretty quick, scalable and cost-effective way to, to print stuff. Um, one of our professors at that point really pushed us to go and, and do something with this and, and said, you know, when you graduate, start a company. She, she gave us some seed money to file the first patent. Um, and we went from there. Um, the next phase was more, well, as engineering, uh, with an engineering, mechanical engineering background, there, there's a couple of things, right? I, I think number one is you don't really, um, we didn't have any software knowledge. We didn't have any materials knowledge. And to deliver a viable kind of product, you really need to add those disciplines. So we, we pretty quickly um, grew the team to do that. Um, but the second thing is, where do you go with it? Because I think 3D printing is such a broad term. Um, I always compare it to, to the term, like it's, it's as broad as the term car. You know, you, and you have cars for off-roading, you have cars for the racetrack, you have cars for your commute. And, and a 3D printer, you really can't say, I'm going to take this 3D printer that's meant for um, the automotive industry or for aerospace parts or for shoes, and I'm going to print dental models with it. Um, it's not necessarily, it can work, um, but it's not necessarily optimized for that. And so we, we very early on decided we need to pick a vertical, a focus, um, and, and just focus all our resources on doing one thing and trying to do that really well. Um, Actually, initially we said, let's not do that for dental. Um, as engineers, we were kind of afraid of, you know, dental, medical applications, it sounded very scary, regulatory. Mm. Let's, you know, that's the last thing we'll do. Um, 
but our first customer was an orthodontist. He, he was a, a doctor down in Singapore. He still has the machine um, about six years now or five years now. He's um, he sent us an email and, and said, uh, you know, I, I have another printer. I'm printing my own uh, models for clear aligners. Um, it's, it's too slow. I saw on your website that you have a faster technology. Um, and he ordered a machine. It was our first customer. And myself and the other founders went over, installed the printer for him, and started to look at, you know, what's he doing with it and why is he doing that? Um, and started to learn the workflow. Then we realized, okay, if, if, if one guy is doing this, there may be more. Um, we started attending dental trade shows. Um, we were fortunate that actually a fairly sizable show um, item is actually in Singapore. Um, we went there, we met with a couple of materials companies, software companies, and really sort of realized, okay, this is, there's something here because this wave of this whole industry shifting from analog process to digital process and 3D printing along with scanning being a real enabler of that, uh, we figured, okay, that's, that's something where we, you know, with our proprietary technology that has specifically high speed, um, and this being a real production application, this is something where we want to play. Um, and yeah, I guess that's in short um, how we ended up here. And I mean, it, it's a, a fascinating story because I mean, Structo currently is well known for, <coughs> excuse me, for uh, models for the orthodontic business. Is that fair right. to say? Yeah, that's, that's the bulk of our, of our volume if you look at the, uh, at the business. And, uh, uh, you know, now as you look at Structo, you're taking it to a, a bit of a different direction in uh, chair-side printing. And tell us a bit about right. that. And, and really, what's the goal of Structo at this point? Yeah, so a good question. I think, you know, our, our goal is to be the 3D printer company in the dental space. And, and having that focus is really key, right? Because it allows us to do product development based on um, requirements. And so we have three, right now, three sort of ranges of products. We have the Dentiform, uh, which has been in the market for a couple of years, um, you know, which is really sort of for the medium to large lab, uh, high throughput model printer. Um, we have a large automation system, um, which is kind of more focused in terms of, you know, we have a couple of customers who at some point had 50, 60 of our machines and labor cost and the scalability and consistency starts to really become a challenge. And we say, okay, how can we help by creating essentially an aligner factory and do everything from printing to washing to post-processing, curing, uh, automating QC, scanning every model automatically, all of that type of stuff. Um, so we partnered up with an automation supplier and, and built that whole line. Um, that's now live uh, in California. Um, and then more recently is, is like you said, the chair-side focus. And that's a bit of a shift for us because chair-side, you're not talking as much about throughput capacity, right? It's not so much about the volume. It's much more about ease of use, workflow, cleanliness, um, speed, but linear speed. Like how quickly can I get one model versus how many models can I get per hour? And that's a, that's a subtle but important difference, right? Between how labs and, and clinics might look at uh, cases. Um, we started Velox at, well, it really started at IDS in 2017, so two IDSs ago. Um, we, we sort of did our rounds and we saw over, I think over 30 printers, let's call it 30 printers that were below $10,000 and targeted at chair side or at least small labs. Um, and, and we figured, okay, that's, you know, clearly there's something there, but how do we how do we enter that segment and provide a solution without being number 31, right? How, you know, that's not the goal here. Um, and so what we came up with is, is basically a design spec, a requirement um, that is a couple of things. So number one, fully automated post-processing, uh, which we define as glove-free workflow. So you have to be able to use the machine without touching anything icky. Um, it has to be directly integrated with end-to-end uh, -end design services so that you get a full um, start to finish workflow essentially from the scan to a final part. Um, it has to do all of that in less than one square foot of desktop space because I think in 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 the in the clinics um, you know space is often a premium. You don't want to have a printer and a washer and a curing in kind of a, a wet lab, dirty area that needs to be a separate room. Um, all of that has to go away if you want a real, true, convenient chair side solution. Um, and the vision is really to make this much more uh, just a delivery unit than a printer. It should just be a thing where you press a button and your 
of lines comes out, whether it's a splint or a, a surgical guide or an, or a, an aligner model. Um, I think you know it's it's when you look at those thirty other machines at, at IDS and and when the way we tend to think of things as engineers and this is very tempting is we talk about the product in terms of um, accuracy, microns, speed, uh, mean time between failures, all those kinds of metrics. But I've never had a conversation with a dentist who's interested in how many microns you got. Like it should, it's like it's like going to buy a car and and the sales guy tells you it has wheels. Like that should be a given, right? That's not the point of what a printer should be for chair side. So for Velox, we don't, I mean, for the labs we do, but for Velox, we don't try to talk in those metrics. We consider that, you know, good accuracy, high speed, those should be givens. Um, and the real qualifiers are ease of use, the workflow, the cleanliness, um, range of materials that are available. And can you, can this really take you to same day dentistry, single appointment dentistry, um, and, and take that, that workflow to the next level. Um, so. That's yeah, I, I, as a uh, uh, what I would call a, a capitalist, you know, or an investor, I uh, uh, my mindset always is when I look at companies, uh, you know, what problem are they solving, and is that problem that they're solving valuable enough to uh, to the person they're solving it for that uh, they're willing to uh, part with hundred and dollars to, to solve it. And so I think it will help people if you could give them uh, a perspective on what the locks actually does. And I know uh, your team sent us a, a video. So, uh, you know, I'm just going to ask the evident group if they can uh, share that and uh, you can talk us through, you know, what's actually happening in this video. Cause it's uh, I mean, normally uh, 3D printers are easy to understand, but I was actually surprised at, uh, at uh, what the Velox can do when uh, when I saw it. So uh, just a shout out to the Evident group and let's see. And yeah, I'll, I'll sort of try to narrate it a little bit. Um, yeah, so the, 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 real, the real point is here, it, it functions very similar to most other printers for the printing part, right? So if you've ever used a 3D printer, this bit is very familiar. Then we have this rotating platform that takes it through all the post process. So there's a washing stage, there's a rinsing stage in water, and then there's a post curing stage. And the nice thing is it can accomplish the full end-to-end -end process with only two moving parts, right? Because you've got the vertical moving platform and you've got the rotating disc. And what you end up with is a clean, dry, cured part that's ready to use. You can take it out without gloves. And all of that has happened within that one square foot little unit. Um, so it's not the largest platform, um, but that's not the point, right? It's about fast turnaround of single cases with zero effort. Um, and I think that's, you know, that was the brief to our engineering team. And, and I think uh, it's come out really, really well. And, and then as an ancillary to this, uh, you know, I know Paul Perkins had posted the question on, uh, is it a validated workflow? Because that's really what's uh, in everyone's mind. And I look at this printer and I go, okay, this will work for, you know, small labs or, or large practices uh, or chair side, even in specific practices with the use for it. So uh, I wanted to prepare uh, or share the video that we have of how the workflow works with, uh, with Evident, just so people can get a perspective on what this machine does. And then uh, we can have that discussion on on how it works and the impact on the lab business uh, in general. So, uh, the guys at Evident, can you fire away with that video? I'll kick this off by saying uh, a year or so ago, who came to us and said, look, I, I want to make it so that uh, a dentist or lab can scan 
and uh, the file can get automatically sent to Evident, uh, where Evident can do the designs, and then even slice and prepare the file for printing, and then automatically load it to the machine. And I want to get to the point that uh, all the, the operator needs to do is confirm there's enough material in there, press a button, and off they go. And that's what we were tasked with a year ago. And, and uh, that's what we've been working on with the uh, Destructo 3D team uh, since then. And we're about 95% of the way there. I think there's one last connection that, that uh, we need to work through. But as of now, you could uh, pretty much do it seamlessly, uh, except for you still have to do the final link of transferring a file manually. But uh, uh, that's a, an easy solution for us to, to deal with once a, a printer is installed. And uh, so th there's two questions that, that come out of that. Uh, a, who, what's your vision for this, the seamless workflow? And then B, how do you think it will impact laboratories? So, because I know that's a question burning in everyone's yeah, mind. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, and that's, that's one we, you know, we actually ponder ourselves a lot because obviously our current customer base is, is almost entirely labs, right? So we we look at how can we partner. Um, but to address the first bit, I think, like you said, it, it's it, the goal is for a dentist to be able to upload a scan to the Evident platform um, and get everything done um, from the actual treatment planning, you know, uh, file design to the nesting, the support structure, the slicing, and have that file get sent remotely directly onto the machine and you just have to press go um, or not even, right? You could have a situation where, and all the hardware and connectivity is in place to do this, where um, you, uh, you know, you just put enough material in the printer and you sort of place the printer in a ready state where it's ready to receive a file. And then whenever, Evident has turned around the file and, and sends it over to the machine, it can directly start. So whether you're by that point in the next appointment with your patient or, or you've left for the, for the day and you're coming back the next morning, that file will be there when you, when you come back. Um, and that, you know, that means that ultimately what you're getting is you're uploading a scan and you're getting an appliance out the other end with zero effort in between. And that's, at, at, you know, our vision is for dentists to be able to spend their time with patients on clinical outcomes because A, that's where you make your money. B, that's what you went to school for all those years, you know, and, and that's what you should be doing. Um, nobody wants to be operating a machine. Um, and that's why I said, you know, it's not, the idea is not that it's a 3D printer. It's just a delivery box um, that fulfills that last step of physically manufacturing the part and does so in the practice. Um, in terms of Paul's question around validated workflow, it's, it's very, very important to us that it is validated. Um, and we're doing that now with various partners through various applications. Um, but one thing to note is, uh, you know, this printer actually is particularly well equipped to do that because what we can do, you know, I've seen, I've seen in, in the Facebook groups of, 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 uh, of 3D printer users um, of other printers where people upload questions of, you know, I printed the surgical guide and it broke. And you'll, you look at the picture and you see it's printed in a model material. Um, and they've put that in a patient's mouth, right? And that's not anybody's fault. It's just there's a lack of sort of awareness, education, and all of that. Um, but with this printer, you can prevent that because if evidence sends over a file, a case, and that case is tagged and it says, this is a temporary crown, um, the printer will refuse to start if you don't have resin poured in there from a bottle with a tag that is temporary crown, you scan the bottle. So you can never really go wrong. Um, we've seen people buying printers um, and then saying, well, that post curing unit is an extra thousand bucks. I, I'll just stick my appliances in the window in the sun for a bit. Um, there's people who do this, right? And, and at some point, I think the regulatory landscape around 3D printing is going to start uh, evolving where this stuff is no longer allowed and you have to be able to control it. So to future proof ourselves and our customers for that, it's really the vision there is, you know, this machine will ensure that every part that is printed gets washed for an adequate amount of time in an adequately clean, clear, fresh amount of solvent. Um, it gets post-cured for an adequate amount of time under the right intensity in the right uh, settings. Um, and you as a user don't even get to touch it until it's done in accordance with that specification. So the control over that, that validated workflow um, 
is really critical and and the ability of this machine to to you know be safe uh for your business when inevitably the the regulatory landscape um tightens down around these things i think is is part of sort of the longer term view of of why we're doing this um yeah uh, we've got a couple of polls teed up uh i'm just curious you know how many people have heard of structo 3d prior to this and uh uh i i i wonder what their answer would be uh I do too. Yeah. And then what uh, What percentage of cases do people actually uh, mill or print in their practices? So these are three polls that I wanted to run just to get a gauge, uh, whether it's practice or lab, to get a gauge of uh, uh, awareness out there and uh, get an insight into what people are thinking. So our first poll is, you know, who here has heard of Structo 3D? Uh, because, ah, about half, it's a good number. Yeah. Um, I know that you guys are, are uh, quite strong in Asia. I mean, we were chatting before the show, and uh, right now you guys are, are cranking it out, uh, you know, dealing with uh, governments in Asia. And uh, as a sign of your commitment to the North American market, you've actually moved to Toronto. And yes. so... <laughs> and now you're currently locked down in Toronto, so I got no choice. <laughs> and so yeah, I know you and and some of the co-founders have actually moved residences to Toronto and to uh, LA uh, yeah. to to drive the growth of the company. And then, uh, yeah, w we've got a couple of polls like what percentage of cases do people mill and what percentage of cases do people print, just to give us an idea of. Uh, the, you know, the makeup of the audience today. So as far as milling, uh, oh, a good chunk or more than, more than 60%. So we do have a, a very digital savvy crowd. And then for printing, you know, I guess more specifically, you know, what percentage of the cases actually touch some sort of output from a 3D printer, whether it be a model or or a wax up or, or a splint surgical guide. Uh, no, I'm just curious. So then we've got a couple of questions here, Hoob. I mean, first, uh, what do you think the impact is on the lab business? I mean, are you, uh, are you going to be a threat to the lab business? Oh, here's yeah, interesting, less, less than 10% of cases involved with, or sorry, more than half of the attendees uh, say that less than 10% of their cases uh, factor in a 3D printer. So, you know, it tells you there's a bit of room to grow the marketplace there and usability of these printers. And I'm, I'm curious to know uh, in your mind why that is. And more importantly, like I said originally, uh, what do you think the impact is of a chair side printer in the in the lab market? Yeah, that's 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 a very sort of almost existential question, right? I think you know a few things to note there. The, the, the first is not everything can be printed chair side, right? So there's a lot of appliances um, that are simply not to be three D printed, um, at least not to be three D printed in one part. Um, without significant post process or you know the staining or things like that. So, if you look at say uh, prosthetics, full dentures, we're getting there, but uh, there's still a huge quality difference between a printed denture and let's call it a real denture, right? It's and that's whatever you know. Some people might tell you that a printed denture is good, and and they're good, but a chair side printed denture, I don't think would ever or not yet be at the same level, um, and that's true finances. Um, labs have, have in-house design and manufacturing expertise that needs to be deployed for, you know, um, these type of more intricate or more advanced appliances. Um, and I think, I, I look at it as an analogy to, to chair-side milling, right? When, when chair-side milling sort of became a thing, um, milling centers certainly didn't go out of business. Labs certainly didn't stop buying larger industrial milling machines to produce things, you know, faster, better, different materials. Um, so I, I don't see 
necessarily chair side printing being any different in terms of what labs would use printers for or in terms of case volume still driven to labs. Um, I will say, I think eventually it, it's really more the whole shift from analog to digital, which, which is in the whole industry, is something that everyone has to look at and say, how does this, you know, what does this mean for my business and how it needs to evolve? And I think, you know, evident is, is really very, very sensible in, in, in the position right now, because I think, you know, if you look at what does a dental lab do um, from start to finish, right? You're receiving a file and then the real value add part is where you're designing that appliance, doing the treatment planning, looking at the needs of the customer. That manufacturing step where you have a piece of equipment and you have an operator who operates it, that's ultimately just a race to the bottom cost competitive situation, right? Because anyone with the same amount of money can buy the same equipment and hire the same operator and do the same thing with the same materials. Um, you know, so to, to shift that part of business into chair side, but keep um, the actual treatment consultation, treatment planning, and, and appliance design as the core business of the lab. That's where the true value add is, and that's where, at the end of the day, uh, you know, that's where you you differentiate your quality versus other labs, your turnaround company versus other labs. Um, and and if that manufacturing step sits, you know, we've had conversations with lab labs or larger lab groups where the lab can actually act as a distributor for this printer and place it in their customers' practices and say, we will sell you a branded appliance that's still, you know, it's, it's branded LabX because it's designed by LabX, just that the final step of physical fulfillment of manufacturing happens share site um, with an approved material and an approved workflow. And I think that's more, you know, you look at how businesses need to evolve in the future of this digital uh, condition of the industry, that's really, just a different way of looking at it. It definitely doesn't make labs obsolete. Um, added benefit is, you know, if if you were set up this way as a lab, when COVID hits, all the wizards on the CAD systems can take their laptop home and, and do that from home, right? You don't exactly take the printer or the milling machine home. So the ability to um, survive these type of, of, of crises and who knows what else can happen, um, or at least to come out of them more strongly as soon as practices do reopen, I think it's, it's the more everyone shifts towards um, the digital part of the workflow and leave the physical part, cut out the logistics, cut out the physical, you know, transporting of impressions to the lab and physical parts back to the practice. Uh, I think that's the way to go. You know, uh, it's funny because uh, what, over a year ago when you first sat down with me and said, I wanted to do a, a seamless workflow wherein yeah, anyone with a, an old computer can load the file to the cloud and have us design it and then we'll feed it back to, to your equipment. When we started working on this uh, over a year ago, uh, and I talked to a number of suppliers, there was no interest from a lot of suppliers in doing an integrated workflow with us. Today, our phones are ringing off the hook from uh, people that, of course, if you're selling capital equipment nowadays, you know, it's a struggle because people are hanging onto their wallets and, and don't want to invest in, in the CapEx. And what people are looking for is much more of a seamless experience, whether they're operating or they're selling printers or milling machines or scanners. And uh, the number of people that are reaching out to us today to find a way to integrate uh, a seamless evidence solution is, is uh, actually quite surprising. And, uh, you're way ahead of the curve there, Hoob, I, I got to tell you. So, oh, well done. Right behind you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and a, a few other uh, questions are popping up here. Uh, you know, first, again, from Paul, who seems to be a big fan of yours. Uh, uh, Paul Perkins in the UK is saying Structo's uh, uh, big in the UK and, uh, you know, the, the brand's getting well known. So. Well done, uh, and thanks for saying that, Paul. Uh, one of the questions is, what's the cost of the locks? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, it's actually on the website, so we have we've set up. So the other part of this is that the Velox can be bought, and 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 you can fully interact with it with the whole customer experience uh, through Web Store, um, which is obviously not the case for the lab products. Um, we're pricing it as a, a monthly service model. And the point of that is really to, uh, to make 
sure it covers everything because the other part of you know when i talked about what are the user requirements the real user requirements in this is that it's sort of a worry free not just a worry free machine to use but a worry free interaction with us as a supplier and we don't want to you know obviously um great support costs money um and so what we said is okay let's let's price this with one single monthly fee um well i say one single there's three different plans between 6.99 and uh, I think 11.99 a month, um, where what you get is you get the printer, you get 24/7 support, and this is you know we have our offices in Singapore, we have uh, the UK, we have Toronto, which is Eastern time, and we have LA, which is Pacific time. So between those time zones, we're actually able to if you call our our support number, someone will pick up the phone 24 hours a day, um, wherever you are in the world, um, and that's that's part one. Um, Part two is if there is any issue with the printer, we hot swap it. You know, so that's there's no sort of downtime concern there. Um, and and the third thing um, is all your consumables except the resin itself, obviously, which is just depends on how much you print. But your resin tanks, your basements, whatever you call them, um, those are also you know on on that plan. So it's all prorated to your usage and. It's the idea is you, you don't have to, you know, on, on the lab side, we often end up with someone has a printer and they call us and say, I need to send out a case and I forgot to order my, my, my tanks or my Teflon sheets or whatever it is. And can you overnight one and I'll pay whatever you need to get it overnight. We don't want customers in that situation, right? So um, connectivity of the device is one thing where we can track the life of all these parts um, and we can automatically send you when we know that you're going to need it. Um, and all of that being on a subscription basis uh, is about just having that same clean, smooth, simple uh, workflow. So it is a, a premium price. I, I hope let's let's not be uh, uh, be dishonest about that. It's it's not the cheapest printer, but, but ultimately you have to compare it to um, you know number one, it includes the washing and cleaning and curing. Um, so normally you'd have to pay extra for those devices. You need space for those devices, but most importantly, you need operators for those devices. And what we see in a lot of cases is the operator is actually still the dentist or a hygienist or someone where if you really do the math on their time for them to take a print, go onto the machine, put on gloves, take it out, stick it in the alcohol to wash, wait 10 minutes, come back again 10 minutes later, put on gloves again, uh, put it in the post curing, you know, come back 30 minutes later, take it out again, remove the supports, all of that and the disruption that it causes to other work, unless you have dedicated printer operators, at which point you're essentially, you have a lab in the back, right? Um, I think the pricing, you have to look at it as, what's the total cost of ownership and how does that compare to my cost of using um, another, another printer? Well, the, the, the quick math to be is it's equivalent to be, to be about uh, an hour, an hour and a half of chair time. If you can save an hour, hour and a half of chair time, you paid for the machine and right, exactly. let alone whatever uh, revenue it creates. I also, I mean, from our standpoint, uh, the Evident Design Center actually does all the slicing so that the file is printer ready. So it's as close to no touch as we can make it. Uh, the question I have is this also, to challenge the business model of laboratories a bit. I mean, if I'm a big lab, could I not, or even a small lab, could I not buy a fleet of uh, Structo 3D Velox printers and, you know, suddenly go to my large clients and say, here, we'll maintain it, we'll put it in your practice, here's the per use fee, and then you become part of digitizing dentistry as opposed to, to uh, you know, being threatened by it. I mean... What's yeah. to stop anyone from, from doing that? You could easily buy, you know, come to an arrangement with Structor 3 d and, and deploy 50, 100 of these. That, yeah, and that's exactly, that, that's, that's exactly what we're trying, like the conversations we're having with a few of these groups is, you know, that and DSOs uh, do the same thing for their internal sort of groups. I think um, that idea and really for us to provide this as a, a business model in a box, um, you know, having that printer and having that, like I said, a branded experience where you then as a lab also become the reseller for the material and, and those materials can be, you know, part of, you know, it, it's instead of selling the actual final device or appliance, you're just going to be selling the same amount of grams of material and the digital file, 
which is 90% of everything you're selling today, except that that final bit of fulfillment takes place in the hands of the, of the practice and you're actually sh uh, cutting out the, the shipping costs, logistics costs um, and time, really turn around time, right? So if you can get your design, this is where Evident is great, if you can get the design time down to an hour, then suddenly single appointment dentistry for a lot of things, you know, single appointment to put in a quick uh, printed temporary crown um, becomes very easy. Um, you know, so that's, yeah, definitely. I think that's a, that's a great model. Okay. I know in the, in the test we've run with the, the blocks, oftentimes what we're waiting on is for the dentist to approve the case or the lab to approve the case, right. not how quickly we can turn the case around. Yeah. Uh, just a quick poll here. Who's heard of the, the struct of the locks before? I'm just curious. And then what materials, while, while people are answering the poll, what materials and what can you print right now? Uh, so those are some of the, the questions that are being asked, uh, Hoob. Yes. So um, we have a couple of, uh, of our own materials, um, which we also have on the, on the lab printer. But for Velox, we've decided to, to sort of take a, a semi-open platform strategy, um, which is, you know, we're open to working with any material so long as uh, we validate it, right? Because ultimately, we're providing the support in this machine and we don't want people just pouring anything in and then calling our helpline if it gets broken um, or doesn't work or doesn't print accurately or any of those things. This goes back to the, the, the approved and controlled workflow. Um, but so we're working with third-party material uh, providers and because of that we have a pretty wide range uh, that will be available. Right now I think we're doing or what we have validated so far end to end is obviously model um, uh, a clear byte splint a surgical guide uh, indirect bonding tray. Um, and we'll be adding um, we'll be adding temporary crowns, denture bases, uh, and a few other basic materials like gingiva mask and things like that. Um. So again, that that seems to be what everyone's focused on. And I, someone made the comment that uh, Hub's voice is not clear. Is it uh, hard to to hear what Hub is is saying? Uh, if you guys just don't mind, uh, I firing uh, on the chat whether uh, you guys can hear him okay or not that that would be great but uh, you know can you just repeat the the uh, items that uh, you can print today who yeah. yeah so we we today it's launched with um, model uh, surgical guide uh, splint and an indirect bonding tray and we'll be adding temporary crown and bridge materials in a number of shades um, denture base materials in a number of shades, and uh, the soft tissue and casts, which are essentially non-regulated uh, basic materials. So that's all coming out over the next few months. Okay. Thank you. I mean, we're, we're getting a different feedback from everyone. So hopefully, uh, leaning closer to the computer will help out, because that's, uh, that's a key question that that people are asking. And then how do you handle shade matching? This is a an interesting question, you know. How how do you handle shade matching or is that even in the product uh, roadmap today? It's it's early. Um let me know if this is clear. I've I've switched the microphone. Um perfect to me. Okay. Um yeah it's early days but what we're what we have is uh I think five going on seven different shades now for the, the teeth and three or four for the base. Um, and, and, and the, the, you know, but the pathway of really matching that, that comes more to our, our partnerships, right. And how we go from the scan and, and, and really the requirements, um, to, you know, what, you know, how do we, how do we match it? But it, it will be similar to any other printer on which you have multiple shades material printing. And it will just be a matter of swapping out the resin and printing in the right color of resin. Um, so unfortunately, not yet the ability to sort of do a, a multi-shade direct print um, within one within one part. Um, still, uh, still early for that. Um, and uh, you know, for for the the audience, I mean, this is obviously a a, a big trend in in uh, dentistry today with the manufacturers getting hammered because uh, the capital expenses or the capital investment in the industry has just you know, died significantly. 
So people are not buying expensive equipment, uh, and rightfully so because of the uncertain times. So the number of companies that have approached us to try and figure out how they create a, a recurring revenue to support their their equipment has been uh, uh, fairly impressive. So, so it tells me there's definitely a trend to for companies with hardware to go, okay, now we need someone to help design this thing so that uh, uh, or design restorations so that the labs that, that they service can be far more efficient in, in producing what uh, they need to produce. And I, I think that's part of the model moving forward. That's why when I say, you know, as I, as I listen to you, I go, if I were running a lab operation, there certainly might be an opportunity to deploy these uh, in dentist offices. And then, you know, you save all the shipping and logistics costs and you truly become the quarterback of the case. I mean, that's just throwing that out there as far as opportunities go to, to expand revenue. Um, are the list of uh, options for the Velox listed on the website? Um, I'm going to say I'm 90% sure on that. I think so. Um, if not, uh, yeah, I, I think at least the ones that are live now definitely are there because they're in the store uh, to be ordered. And, and what's coming and when it's coming, I think, is somewhere on there as well. And uh, soft tissue and cast, I mean, uh, are those something things that the Velox can can print? Yeah, yeah, to be honest, those, you know, th those are really, um, frankly, the, the easier ones um, because they're not, they're not regulated, right? They're, they're never going to, those are never going to go in a patient's mouth. Um, yeah. So they're, they're easy to do, but there's kind of bottom of the list for us in terms of validating and setting up the printing protocol just because they're very low volume and relatively low value um, compared to say, printing uh, a splint, a night guard, a surgical guide. Um, so that's where the priority has been. Um, but we have the materials available. It's just right now a bandwidth issue. And well, actually we're not even, our, our R&D team in Singapore isn't yet allowed to be back at work again on this. So we're, uh, we're, we're working on when we get back to that. Got it. Well, I mean, you guys have, uh, as you mentioned, you have been very busy lately. Uh, and uh, maybe, touch on uh, your heritage in Singapore and what the things are that you're doing for uh, the government of Singapore that's uh, helping them through this COVID crisis. Yeah, it's, it's similar to you know, the situation everywhere in the world, which has been, um, you know, can you 3D print? Uh, it started with face shields and masks and, and that type of stuff, which are obviously we can just print them in model material. Um, we've set up a, a COVID response page actually where some of the designs and, and parts that we've uh, come up with are, are available to to other users of our printers. Um, anyone who who, uh, who has our machine or even another machine can download those files and uh, and, and go run with them. Um, the bigger project is really the swaps, the, the nasopharyngeal swaps for testing, and, and we've been going through about two months of uh, sort of clinical validation and, and design iteration and, and working on that, and we're printing. Uh, well, we're going to be doing a couple of million of them. Um, between now and sort of August, September. Um, as I think, you know, when, when this all started, we thought of swabs as something that, uh, you know, as the virus peaks, we're going to need a lot of those and then it'll decline. But the thing in Singapore is that it's becoming, um, it, it's the reality is we're going to need swabs on a consistent basis in order to be safely open, right? So even when the virus is and has declined, um, the point is you need to keep testing widely and, and tracing and isolating cases um, to stay safe. So this has a much, much longer tail than we thought. And this has become a, a, a priority in terms of, you know, just machine allocation. We've, we've actually hired, uh, I think in the past few weeks, 35 people uh, who are working three shifts to operate machines and print this stuff. Um, that's been for us, you know, uh, a really nice way to be able to give back a bit uh, to uh, the country and, and the environment that's been created for us as a business. Um, so yeah, that's been exciting. Yeah, that's awesome. And another question, are you shipping to the UK? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, so with Velox currently, it's US only. Um, and the reason for that is regulatory. So the, the CE marking for Europe is still um, in progress. It's something where we're having the machine currently tested uh, by TUV, the, the German sort of uh, 
authorities on that. And I think by probably, well, let's not put a hard deadline on it because that can only set us up for failure, but let's say end of the year, we, we think we'll have, and, and really by IDS, uh, which is again next year, March, um, if it happens, um, we think we can really start commercially in Europe as well uh, when we have the CE mark. I am gonna assume that UK is keeping to the EU in, in that sense of, of regulatory. Um, I don't know if Brexit is gonna have any impact on this, uh, but yeah, for us commercially, we're, we're US focused right now. And uh, there's a question here uh, on my board. Is a Veloc good for a lab? What do you think? Uh, of course, <laughs> no, um, uh, it's good for everyone. Uh, have one at home. Um, no, I think <laughs> it depends how big your lab is. Uh, you know, honestly, I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend anyone buying 100 Veloxes and running them in-house for yourself if that's your volume. So the main, the main design trade-off that we had to make when we built it is size of the build plate versus size of the machine, right? And, and the objective was really to build something that's under a square foot of counter space um, and contains everything. But as you saw in the video, if you have that rotating disc and it has to do washing and curing and all of that within that one little space, the platform is just big enough to basically print. Uh, if you put them flat, it's two arches, one upper, one lower. Whether that's two splints, two surgical guides, two models, doesn't really matter, but that's kind of the, the size of the plate. Um, so that means for a lab, it, you know, if you were doing aligner models and you need 30 models a case, wouldn't recommend it, right? Um, then, you know, we'll talk about Dentaform or other printers. Um, but, if you're, you know, if you want to print uh, um, surgical guides or, or splints, which are you know, much higher value per part, then there's no reason why you wouldn't have two or three Veloxes sitting on your bench in the same space, frankly, that it takes to have any other printer with its post-processing um, and save yourself the operating, the operating labor and, and just have that simplicity um, and just run it on that. Uh, I think it's, it's very viable. I mean, if you were running a, you know, two-person lab, wherein you wanted to focus on, on uh, quarterbacking and being the technical advisor to all your customers, yeah. you could easily put a couple of these machines in your lab. For sure. And when the need arises, you print and then off you go. It's not 10 a day, but it could be one a day. No, exactly. And we've seen it, you know, I think there's a lot of labs that have just to name an example, uh, one or two form lab sprinters, right? And they're and they're a bit bigger than the Velox, and they're uh, well slower. But the point is, if if that capacity, and there's a lot of labs that work in that sort of range, right? So if that, that capacity is suitable for you, um, a Velox will definitely do the same because you know you can put four or five quad crown and bridge, you know, die fit models, implant models on that plate, and it'll run it in 45 minutes, and you'll get them yeah. washed in within the hour. So for a lot of, like you said, a two-man lab, a three-man lab, that's very, very realistic in terms of the capacity that you might require. Um, you're not doing hundreds of models a day, right? And at that point, the ease of use really does extend um, to the lab as well. Uh, and uh, I've got a couple of last polls here. Uh, selfishly, we just wanted to to see how many of you guys have tried evident designs uh, who are listening in today. Uh, so, you know, if you don't mind answering that, it gives us an idea. Uh, I had this vision of a swarm of uh, Philox printers that labs would actually deploy. If I'm, now that I'm thinking through it, if I'm a two or three or five or 100 person lab, there's nothing to stop me from deploying these into my customers and really running it as a what I would call a distributed network of, of uh, uh, 3D printers that can operate either uh, individually or in unison when the when the time's needed and then you become you know the, essentially uh, as we've talked about the quarterback as a laboratory operating all of these so there's a business model there that uh, uh, I find very interesting. Um, oh, here's a question from Theodore Shearer. Is your printed product recyclable? Uh, the, yeah, unfortunately not yet. This is something we're, we're working on. And well, it you know, there are two interpretations of that question. I think one is, 
if I throw it in the ground, will it decompose and, and be safe for the environment? That's step one. Step two is can I recycle it and, and, and print again, right? That's, um, that's a little bit harder. Uh, the first is one we're definitely working on. Um, and the second is more of a future vision. Uh, but today, very similar to most other printers, uh, unfortunately not yet. It's all plastic. Okay. And then, uh, uh, how many cycles prints can you run before changing the alcohol? These uh, these questions go above my technical knowledge now. So, no, that's great. That's good. Um, so, it well, the short answer is it depends, um, because what the printer does is it looks at you know, the different resins, whether you're printing models or surgical guides or splints or, or bonding trays, these different resins have different viscosities and stick to the printed part more or less. Um, and so it just monitors sort of the washing cycles in each material and so on. Um, so it, it varies. Um, we're, you know, at the very lowest end, sort of 10 to 15 cycles. Um, and the other thing to remember is this is all built to fit, right? So that, that, that liquid uh, tank is actually very, very small. It only contains just enough volume to wash those two or three parts. Um, so it's, you know, um, it's a very small volume to replace and I, I would imagine it's, it's very much on par with what you'd expect to, to replace. Um, maybe I'll, I'll just take this next question because it, it kind of builds on uh, yeah. the problem of getting isopropyl and what percentage should it be. Um, really good question. We actually, for the Velox, we don't use isopropyl alcohol. Um, and the reason is that within this device, it's a closed chamber, there's electronics in there, and um, the evaporation of isopropyl alcohol is a real risk. And in some countries, especially in Europe, you can't even uh, put isopropyl in an ultrasonic cleaner, technically, even though a lot of people do. Um, and so we have a, a different uh, a formulation of solvent that's non-volatile, non-flammable, uh, that goes into, into the machine. And that goes back to that pricing model of, of all-inclusive. Right, so that comes with uh, with your deal. Basically, you know, we know that if you, you if you've used this X amount of resin and you've printed X number of parts, you're going to need the new solvent. So we're not going to charge you separately for that. It's just all built into um, one full solution um, at one price. So your cost and, is uh, um, Sorry. Yeah, I think your cost is predictable. Someone was asking what's the cost on the Denta form. Uh, yeah. I, I, is it on the site as well? No, it's not. Purchase it's a Denta not. form? It's not. So the list oh. price on the Denta form is, uh, is 29,000 uh, USD. Um, and obviously that's, and, you know, we have a lease model for that as well. And it's always a question of if there's a material contract attached where you're going to use a certain amount of resin um, and you're paying for support and whatnot. So there's a lot more variability there. Um, because it's, you know, for the labs, it's really more of we look at a case by case uh, question of um, what's the suitable economics here. And uh, I just wanted to make sure uh, for anyone who wants CE credits for this uh, webinar, uh, please, we're going to uh, put up a last poll, which is do you want CE credits or not? And anyone who says yes, uh, I think they'll get a certificate. Certainly, the evident team will will send them a, a certificate to to make sure that they get their CE credits. So, uh, I'll, I'm going to ask the evident group to just post that. But uh, as they're doing that, to where do you what if you sit back and I put you and Carbon as a couple of the coolest companies in in the industry today, uh, as far as 3D printing is concerned, both both very different uh, market segments, but you know, certainly very innovative in the way you're approaching those different market segments. And uh, I wanted to, to get your vision for dentistry as you see it, you know, and where do you think, you know, fast forward five years from now, what dentistry is going to look like, or maybe 10? Yeah, that's, well, there's a lot of, a uh, lot of good answers to that one. I think, you know, we look at it as, Going back to the very first poll or, or the second or third poll, I think of how many cases currently involve a 3D printer, right? And, and that number is still surprisingly low. Um, yes. The adoption of printing in labs is, is very much ahead of the curve in, term, in, in comparison to clinics. Um, I think it's the number is something like 1% of dentists have a chair printer. Um, and that's really just the 1% that 
doesn't mind the mess, doesn't mind tinkering a bit, doesn't mind dealing with technology, but it's never sort of transcended that and gone to the next level of being a mainstream usable product. So that's what we see as the next decade of, of printing is let's take this, this analog to digital transition and, you know, cross over to the mainstream and have this just be another tool in the belt of every practitioner and every lab, um, you know, but the labs are already getting there. Um, in the clinics, there's still a, a way to go. And it's, it's in part, it's education, it's, it's you know, um, and, but it's, it's also just this ease of workflow. And that's where partnerships like this with, with between Evident and Structor really are the result of us having that, that you know, um, uh, relentless focus on dental applications and building stuff from the ground up for a very specific set of user requirements uh, that lets us sort of think through what that next generation of products looks like. Yeah, I, I think you're, you're bang on. And uh, like I said, very few companies, I, I, I think, can see what a, uh, a digital dental network could look like. Because uh, in our experience, dentists uh, do like to tinker around with their own 3D printers and and so on, but oftentimes it's not calibrated properly. The materials have expired, or there's always something going on that requires time and energy. And and really, to have a, a reliable touchless system changes the landscape quite quite drastically. And then on top of that, uh, what they often tell labs is they're the most advanced portion of digital dentistry. And the labs understand digital better than anyone else in the space today. It's just that uh, they don't believe they understand it better than anyone. And so, you know, my hope is that the, the labs will actually realize how advanced they are already and use that to, to change the dynamics of the business as opposed to uh, being afraid of uh, uh, being a victim for change. So, uh, at, at least those are my my observations to date as we sit there designing for you know everyone from labs to dentists to companies like Structo and and various other organizations all around the world. I um, mean, there's certainly the movement to digitize is very strong and uh, it's even pushed uh, faster with uh, COVID. And now you know this vision of a distributed network all around the world is, is, is actually more prevalent than anything else. Um, here's a uh, dentist asking implant over denture impressions. Uh, I don't quite understand the, the question there. Uh, so uh, Dr. D, I think you posted the question implant over denture impressions, but I have no idea what your, your question is. Implant over denture impressions. Yeah. Anyway, uh, you know, uh, as we move on, move on here, Hoob, uh, it's the uh, top of the hour, and uh, I just wanted to say thanks again for your time. I know you guys in in Toronto are still under lockdown, so I appreciate you making the time to to come out and and see us, and uh, all the best. I'm I'm excited for the new Velox, and you know, uh, I hope it takes off. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity and uh, great catching up. Yeah, and hope to see you soon, man. Will do. Uh, and uh, to everyone, thanks again. Appreciate you joining us. Uh, and, uh, you know, hope you stay safe. Okay. Take care.